Well, good afternoon. It's great to be back. Now, obviously, I can't be with you live now. It's about 3 or 4 a.m. in Sydney. Uh, and my thanks to the wonderful Alec Kouros, who has been helping out in some of the discussions you've been having since uh, our talk this morning and now moving into the afternoon. And this morning, I really emphasise, you know, that learning has never been more important. We really have a driver across Ontario to be really thinking about how do we innovate for learning. And of course, one of the, the biggest opportunities we have are these potential of the new technologies, that learning is not what it used to be. But my argument this morning is that we're going to be effective innovators of learning, harnessing digital technologies, that we actually have to focus on the human side of learning like never before. Increasingly thinking about the cognitive and emotional and social elements of human learning, how it happens and when it flourishes and using those insights to think about how do we harness the best of the digital technologies? How do we harness the best innovators in the ed tech world and bring them in to support specific areas that we want to improve? Well, this afternoon, I want to broaden this discussion about leading innovation for better learning. And one of the things I've been doing over the last few years is, I guess, having a foot in two worlds. One, the world of education, being in schools every week, doing my research on international benchmarking of school system performances, thinking lots about schools and how they improve and school systems and how they innovate. But at the same time, I've actually spent a lot of time uh, outside of the education sector, trying to learn the lessons of the most innovative organisations and sectors I can. Thinking about what might we learn from big technology companies like Apple and Google, what might we learn from edtech innovators based out of Silicon Valley? How can we learn from people in social uh, innovation sectors, um, particularly in low-income and middle-income countries? And how might we bring these uh, sort of approaches, these methods and ideas about innovation, and bring them into education as appropriate? And so this afternoon, I just want to share some of this thinking and share five key strategies I'm learning from innovators in other sectors that I think can really help us as we seek to innovate learning, harnessing digital technologies. Uh, to do that, although I, I think I first need to sort of put some parameters about what I even mean about innovation. And I want to really emphasize here that innovation is not an outcome, it's a process. And what we're interested in is applying our own human ingenuity as educators, as teams of educators, our own creative sort of confidence and ability to the relentless pursuit of better learning. And so it's not really about being more innovative. That's not the end point. The end point is better learning. And the question is, can we use innovative methods and mindsets and processes to get to better learning faster, you know, deeper and quicker, and hopefully if we can, at a lower price point as well? So with that as a sort of framing about the type of innovation we're looking for, innovation for better learning, as a process to get to the outcome that we need to decide on, let me give you five strategies that I'm learning from others. And the first one is this, focus on meaningful innovation. There is a tendency uh, when I get the opportunity to go and engage with people trying to innovate in the education space, particularly innovating with the use of digital technologies, to focus too much on the tech. And sometimes I'll turn up and maybe they're giving awards in a certain school system for the most innovative schools. And I'll, and I'll find out, you know, who's the number one? Who won the award? And I'll go and talk to them about their innovation. And I'll sometimes say, you know, tell me all about it. What have you done for student learning? And often, in different parts of the English-speaking world, I get the response, we gave tablets to everybody. And I say, okay, that's really interesting. So what were you trying to do for student learning? What were you trying to achieve? What was the problem worth solving? They said, didn't you hear us? We gave them to everyone, like every teacher, student, support staff, everyone got them. And there, isn't, there is this tendency, isn't there? This sense that actually the more devices that go out and the bolder our plans for digital transformation, we somehow assume that that's also a learning transformation. No, innovation that's really meaningful has a really clear focus on the student learning outcomes it wants to improve. What are you actually trying to do for the young people that you turn up and serve? What's the problem worth solving? And when you get really clear on that problem worth solving, then you can ask, well, what types of technology, what forms, what types of apps might actually help us make progress on this journey? It's not about the actual digital transformation. It's about having a clear vision of a learning transformation enabled by appropriate digital technologies. And so great innovators in other sectors can always answer the question, what is the problem that you're solving? For us, 
What's the learning problem that you're trying to solve? And why do you think this type of technology support, this type of software enabler could really get you there quicker and faster than your current methods? So number one, focus on meaningful innovation. Number two, I want to suggest that you don't rush and determine, oh, this is exactly what we're going to start to do in our own plan at our school or division level uh, discussions about digital transformation. And instead, number two, that you pursue inspiration without borders. I'm always interested when I speak to innovative leaders in other sectors. They're absolutely relentless in the pursuit of new ideas. They go and have a look at the best things happening in their local area, across their country, and often internationally. They're always looking for ways that different leaders and practitioners are trying to push the boundaries and do new things. Because innovative leaders realize that the driver of innovation is associative thinking. Going and being inspired by what's happening elsewhere so that you can make links back into your own context. Not necessarily to copy directly. That doesn't typically work very well in education, which is so important, where context is so important. But no, much more about being inspired by what other people are doing, really understanding what they're doing and what problems they're solving in their context, and using that inspiration to push our own thinking. And so I'd encourage you to think about, you know, what are the other schools you could visit just within your own area for 45 minutes, one lunchtime, or take one uh, lesson time off if you're, if you're not in the classroom, even easier. Head off as a group of leaders and just go and see what they're doing. Not to copy directly, but to see what's happening there and to ask yourself, how does that inspire us for our work? Uh, maybe you'll be fortunate at some time to travel uh, either somewhere, another province in Canada or even down to the US for a conference. Go and take an afternoon off and go and see a few schools rather than being sticking at the conference just listening to the speakers. Because I, I really do think that this exposure to ideas you know, has a huge impact on our own thinking, our own thinking about the possibilities that we have. And lastly, maybe thinking about the best practices and most innovative practices around the world. Yes, I know we won't all be able to go and travel, but we do have the internet. And so when you're sort of mindlessly on an afternoon not making much progress through your inbox or the paperwork and the other work you know you should be doing, why not take a 20 minute break with a coffee and to go and to search some of the most innovative case studies that are happening elsewhere. Maybe have a look at something like the OECD Innovative Learning Environments Project where there's been case studies of different learning environments, really innovative ways of changing learning, often with the use of technology. And go and look at those ca categories and ask yourself, you know, what might we want to do in our place as a result of the inspiration I'm getting from what other leaders are doing in their context? So strategy number two, pursue inspiration for new learning without borders. And number three, once you've actually been inspired about what might happen, I'm going to suggest that you embrace a disciplined innovation approach. Uh, there is a tendency in education to be really uh, excited about new ideas. Uh, and we think that having the new idea is really you know, the key driver of innovation. And it's really just the starting point. Now, after we've had that new idea, we need to really discipline the innovation process to ask ourselves, what's the problem we're trying to solve? How would we know whether we're making progress? and then working with a small group of people to incubate that idea. So as you've got this idea, maybe you work with a small group, maybe from one faculty area or one stage if you're working at the elementary school level. And you work with a small handful of teachers to work out how do we really bring in this technology, this one that we've selected or this approach that we've selected to solve this particular learning challenge. And we work through some rapid prototyping cycles. Uh, we'll try something, uh, using that technology, we'll see what's working, for whom, under what conditions, which students really seem to be lit up by this, uh, what's it like as a teacher to use this device in this way. And then after we get that feedback, we iterate on that. We learn from the things that are working, and we're actually very open to learning from the things that aren't working. You'll hear innovators, particularly in Silicon Valley, talk a lot about failure and embracing failure. But it's not so much that it's a failure that we celebrate when we're entrepreneurial and when we're trying to take risks. No, what we're really celebrating is the learning that comes from failure. That real capacity to say, we tried to do something. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. Now, what can we learn from that experience, from that experiment in learning that we did? 
and now use that to do a new model of learning and try it again tomorrow, put it into practice next week. And so a disciplined innovation approach really is very clear on what you're trying to do, very clear on the kind of evidence you want to glean, whether it's about student outcomes, student engagement, uh, how easy it is for the teacher to use it. And then you work through some rapid prototyping cycles to see in a very small way what's working, for whom, under what conditions. And I really want to emphasize this. You know, in, ed in education, there is no what works. There is no sort of here's the device or here's the software, here's the program, here's the app. And if only you'll use this, you'll get the silver bullet solution to a particular learning problem. Now, actually, context really matters in education. And so our disciplined innovation approach isn't to try to find what works, but to find what's working, for whom, under what conditions. Learning in and through practice in this very disciplined way about how we can ensure that the decisions that we think we want to make at the larger level across our school are working at a smaller level. And one note on this, um, this is not piloting. Uh, this is not making our decisions about what we'll do, uh, starting small and then rolling it out. Now this is really innovation prototyping, being willing through this process to iterate and to change. And if it's working well, to persevere. But if things really aren't working well, we'd pivot. We'd be willing to say, actually, no, our original assumptions about the way this device or uh, this new program was going to work aren't playing out. And we're actually now willing to learn from that and to move in a different direction based on the learning we've had from our disciplined innovation process. So number three, Innovators really embrace disciplined innovation, learning in and through practice about how and if the learning innovations that they've come up with are really working out in practice. And here it's all about innovating in the real world, in the messiness of our classrooms and, and our learning environments and seeing how these digital devices will really play out in ways that we expect and sometimes in ways that we couldn't have planned for. So we've done three so far and really focus on meaningful innovation, which means understanding the problem you're trying to solve. Number two, not rushing to a solution, but being you know, inspired broadly, pursuing inspiration without borders, going and seeing the best examples that are happening both locally and around the world to push your own thinking about what learning empowered by digital resources could really be, look, could, could look like and could be in your context. And number three, embracing a disciplined approach to innovation. That you don't think that the coming up with the new idea is really where the hard work is. The hard work is about learning in the real world, about what's working for whom under what conditions. And once you've got these models working at the end of step three, once you've got them working and they're working well in these small little pockets that you've incubated, the next step in innovation is to work out how to get it to spread. And so number four, how do you activate demand for promising practices? Activate demand for promising practices. You see, once it's working, the big problem for us is often these innovative practices are still only happening in certain pockets within our school, certain pockets within our district. And so the work of the innovative leader who really wants to bring better learning empowered by digital resources to every young person is to work out how do I get those practices moving from one classroom to another, from one stage to another, from one faculty to another, maybe from one school to another. And here I think what we learn from other sectors in innovation is that we should focus much more on the demand side than on the supply side. And by that I mean that teachers don't change their practice unless they actually demand this new practice, unless they see it as being better for them, better for their students, simpler, um, that it creates value for them and helps them really get out the end of the day, out of the door and think, you know, I've got more energy and I had a bigger impact today. And so how do we really think about this? How do we ensure that we're activating this demand from teachers for promising practices? A few quick thoughts. Number one, it's about making sure these practices are simple, reliable, and effective. Now, sometimes I'll talk to an educator who isn't all that keen on using the, the tablets or the computers or the, the devices that have been given to him or her. And I'll say, well, why aren't you using them? You know, tell me a little bit about it. You know, being driven by empathy and having a human-centered design approach. And typically they'll tell me a story of when they planned up a new lesson harnessing these devices. But actually 10 minutes into the lesson, only half of the kids could get on, and another half couldn't get logged on, two of the batteries weren't actually charged, and they just think, you know what? This is not reliable. 
We all know what it's like 10 minutes into a lesson. If we don't have structure, if we're not getting really moving into the, into the content, moving into deeper learning. And rather in the end, he or she is typically trying to deal with behavior management and come up with half a lesson for the group who can't get online or who can't log on properly to do while the other ones carry on with the lesson that was originally planned. Look, maybe you haven't had that experience yet, but there's a lot of lack of reliability actually in some of the ways that we've set up this infrastructure. And teachers sometimes go back to the analog ways of doing things because it's more reliable or it's simpler. And so what we need to do is to think, well, actually, how do we activate the demand for teachers for these devices, these new approaches, by ensuring that the models we create, these promising practices, are really simple? Number two, that they're reliable. And most importantly, that they're effective that students are more engaged, they're doing deeper learning, they're working more effectively than without them. And until we really work that out, we shouldn't expect that teachers just jump on board with the digital bandwagon because they really need to be convinced of that. They need to know what are we asking them to do? Why does it matter for student learning? And how they can actually do it in their own practice. I think we could also activate demand by really creating a more open culture of sharing about the great practices that are happening. Whether this happens in common room meetings, staff meetings, where people have an opportunity to share their practice and share the student work that's being produced, to activate a demand as teachers look upon that and say, wow, that's interesting. You know, those students are the same age as mine, the same grade level as mine. Look at the work they're producing. I'm not getting an opportunity for my students to produce work like that. Maybe I am interested in some of these uh, new opportunities for learning. Uh, sometimes it can have through less, happen through lesson observation, where a teacher who isn't utilising a lot of the devices gets an opportunity to go and observe another teacher who is effectively using these promising practices. But not that this teacher can sort of sit there and watch this innovative practice happen and just you know, somehow by osmosis uh, be transformed into an educator that can use them. No, rather, actually give them a really important role. Ask them to go and give meaningful, timely feedback to this educator about what they're seeing going on in the classroom. Let them do some type of lesson evaluation, lesson observation. Be thinking seriously about the learning that they're noticing. Because that type of opportunity sustains their status and power as an expert educator, but lets them also have a very deep learning experience. Because as you do a lesson evaluation or observation for someone else, you're thinking deeply about learning. And therefore, you're also getting an opportunity to say, well, how is this person designed learning enabled by technology? And of course, in the back of their mind, they're hopefully getting an opportunity to think, what that, might that mean for me? So the, the fourth stage of uh, innovative uh, thinkers and leaders is always about moving from those promising practices developed in stage three, where you embrace discipline innovation, and moving towards activating the demand for these promising practices. Because unless teachers want to do them, unless they see that they're good and that they work and they can have more of an impact with them, it's very unlikely for them to spread beyond those pockets. And the last strategy I want to focus on is actually to do with parents. And it's about engaging parents as co-designers. Engaging parents as co-designers. Um, the realm of technology and technology for learning is one fraught with all sorts of difficulties in how we communicate to our parents what we're trying to do, um, why we're trying to do it for learning. And unless we really engage them early on in you know, a discussion about how these devices can be used for deeper learning and not for distraction, unless we really engage them and give them some strategies of how to negotiate those distractions, particularly if it's a BYOD setting or the device can be taken home, a lot of parents say to me, you know, I'm quite worried now. Before, you know, we had a couple of computers or a, a few things as a family. I felt more control. But now they've got their device for school. They really feel an ownership of it. And I don't really know what's going on there. I, I don't feel like, you know, I really know how to manage the distractions. How do I make sure that students are doing deep work and not just being distracted on them? And so it's really a, a commitment as an innovation community to say, let's bring in our parents more regularly and from the very start. Let's talk to them about you know, the problems that, they f uh, that they're finding at home, perhaps, or the challenges or questions that they have about how these devices are really being used for learning. Uh, can we give some demonstration, maybe even some demonstration lessons that p parents take part in so they can have the experience of what these new technologies, these participatory learning communities, these um, capacity to create and make using devices would look like in a learning environment? 
so they really understand in their mind, okay, wow, these devices are not just sort of a distraction, they're not just noise. These are being used strategically with a real direction on how to improve my students' learning. But they're also equipped with the skills they need at home as a parent to really work out how do they support their student, use those devices effectively, make wise decisions about when technology should be used for what type of uh, learning questions or homework or home learning that they're doing. And when at other times it's all right to pull back and actually to go back to an analog world and, and to do the type of work and contemplative thinking and writing that sometimes requires us to switch off all of that uh, information and noise and access and to really do the deeper contemplative thought that we need to do our own thinking and our own real argument and analysis. So this fifth one is crucially important for us as educators, to engage with parents as co-designers. If we don't do it, we should and could well expect a pushback over time because we haven't really kept parents not just informed, but brought them in as co-designers, people who are working through problems with us to see how this can really work. So look, there's five key strategies for how we can lead innovation for better learning. Innovation is not just about step one, focusing on problems worth solving, you know, innovation that's meaningful and that matters. We've also got to move to being inspired, having new ideation by pursuing inspiration without borders, taking the time to see the best of what's out there and being inspired by it. Number three, innovating in the real world, that we'd embrace disciplined innovation, working in pockets, incubating our promising practices, making sure they're really working with our leading educators in our most innovative stages and grades. And then once we've done that, we can move to spreading it, spreading these practices from a few classrooms, a few faculties, across to every classroom, every faculty. But we'll do that spread through activating demand for promising practices that are simple, reliable, and effective, where people have an open culture that's non-judgmental of sharing what's working for them and how, that other educators might be able to learn the capabilities to harness these devices, these programs, these software, apps, whatever it is, effectively for their learning. But lastly, we don't forget about our parent community, because whilst we're innovating every day on behalf of our students to deepen that learning, our core stakeholder is still actually our parents. We've got to keep them informed and engaged and supported to really play their role. So that's it. These are lessons I'm learning from studying innovation in other sectors. But of course, innovation in school systems, in individual schools, is very different to what happens elsewhere. Our innovation has got to be people-centred. It's got to deal with the complexity of not knowing necessarily how people will respond in any way to the challenges and to the innovations that we bring in. But that said, I'm going to wish you all the best for the work you're going to be doing over the next day as you think about what these ideas of human-shaped learning innovation would really look like in your school and your district. And I wish you all the best for your deliberations and your discussions.